Everyone, thanks for joining tonight. We'll get started soon after a few more folks have joined on the webcast. Awesome, it's now 6.01, so I'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for the Oregon's Orcas webcast. My name is Allie Fisher, and I'll be your MC for tonight. I'm the Wildlife and Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Associate for Oregon Wild, and I'm really honored to introduce our guest for tonight. First, we have Dr. Giles, who is the Science and Research Director at the nonprofit Wild Orca and specializes in marine mammals of the Sailor Sea, killer whale health, physiology and diet, southern resident orcas, orca, orca population dynamics and reproduction, conservation biology, and Sailor Sea ecosystem health. Tonight, we also have Quinn Reed, who works to protect and restore Oregon's imperiled species and landscapes as the Oregon Policy Director for the Center for Biological Diversity. Before joining the center, Quinn worked as the Northwest Program Director at Defenders of Wildlife. She holds a bachelor degree in political science from the University of Washington and a law degree from the University of San Diego School of Law. I would also like to offer a offer gratitude for the land itself tonight and for those who have lived here in Oregon since time immemorial. I would like to acknowledge the continuing presence of indigenous peoples on the land today. The history of tribes in Oregon is very complex and nuanced and includes colonial legacies and wrongdoings like forced removal that have had long lasting and current impacts. So it's really important to not only acknowledge indigenous people in the present and the land, but to continue to do meaningful work by supporting them respecting and uplifting tribal sovereignty and taking action. Additionally, our raffle is still open, but will be closed by tomorrow morning. So if you're interested in any of the prizes, make sure to buy your tickets. A recording of this program will be emailed out this week and will, will be posted on our website, OregonWild.org and the Wild blog. Lastly, please make sure to put your questions in the Q&A. We normally get a flood of questions towards the end of the presentation. So the sooner you can get your questions in the Q&A, the easier it will be for me to organize them um, after our guests have finished presenting. Lastly, make sure to RSVP for our upcoming webcast next week about marbled murelets. And with that, I'll pass it off to Dr. Giles. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. Um, I'm really excited to um, uh, see that Oregon is engaging uh, in, in this way. Um, you know, we Washingtonians uh, are accustomed to kind of claiming the Southern residents as being Washington's whales, but, um, but they're really not. You know, first off, they're nobody's whales. Um, they're their own uh, unique, amazing tribe of beings. Um, but as far as people being engaged uh, to help this population of whales, um, it absolutely uh, makes sense for Oregon to engage and California to engage, uh, just like uh, Washington and BC Canada are engaged at this point. Uh, because, of course, the Southern Residence Range uh, passes through Oregon waters all the way down to Monterey, California. So I'll show a, a little video. Uh, I mean, not a video, pardon me, a um, uh, slideshow brief. I'll make it quick. Um, thank you uh, for the all the new new. I don't get to see any faces, which actually kind of bums me out. But um, I do see a couple of uh, familiar names. So Bonnie, Heather, Terry. Thank you for joining. Um, this will be absolutely a repeat for you guys. But um, thank you for coming and and supporting Oregon's efforts. Um, so uh, there we go. So uh, my name is Giles. Uh, I'm the Science and Research Director at the nonprofit Wild Orca, which is based in Washington State. Our main office is uh, here on San Juan Island um, 
in Friday Harbor, and we operate our vessel out of Snug Harbor on the northwest side of the island. So uh, Wild Orca's Southern Resident Killer Whale Health Monitoring Program um, seeks to fulfill the mission of, of, uh, of Wild Orca, um, which is on the next slide, evidently. I, I have left this in. This was actually a, um, uh, originally not, not meant to stay in my PowerPoint, but the more I see it, the more I really like it. Um, and I, I hope that the, this quote from Walt Disney inspires you as well. Uh, which is, um, you know, to basically let's quit talking and let's get get action going. Uh, these whales don't have a lot of time uh, left, and it's going to take all of us engaging in a really proactive way to save them. So Wild Orca's mission uh, is to uh, translating science into action to save the southern resident orcas or killer whales from extinction. And we do this using uh, what we feel is a very unique three-pronged approach. Number one, we have conservation conservation research, uh, which is very much engaged with on the water uh, fecal collection. We utilize a scent detection dog on the front of the boat to um, help us locate uh, killer whale feces from a very far distance. So we don't have to be anywhere near the animals to, to locate feces and collect those. We collect that out of the water and it ends up at our lab down in San Diego. And um, at the end of the presentation, I'll talk to you about some of the findings that we can uh, pull out of, of just one, one fecal sample. Um, our next, uh, the, the next thing that we engage in is what we call our strategic advocacy. Um, this is uh, the, the prong in which we take science and we translate it in a way that's digestible, understandable um, to everybody. And then we take that um, information and put it into what we call deeper dives. So we're uh, taking published articles and translating it in a, in a way that everybody understands, can engage, and then we give the next step by um, providing uh, opportunities within our action page. So wildorca.org slash action is a very specific directed um, um, efforts that individuals can take. And lastly, uh, the, the third prong of our approach is our policy engagement. And actually our policy uh, um, manager, Terry, is on the call. So thanks for joining us, Terry. Um, what, what we do, what Terry does is um, we have a, a very engaged, uh, um, we try and engage very directly with elected officials. Um, just today, we uh, were fortunate to have uh, a meeting with Representative uh, Rick Larson, uh, one of his senior aides, um, to discuss issues surrounding the Southern residents. So we're we're taking the information that we translate and we actually put that in the hands of policymakers. And so with this three-pronged approach, we really feel like this is the best way to protect the whales. And in short, we call it our from detection to protection um, uh, actions, our three-pronged approach. So uh, who are the killer Southern resident killer whales? I was asked to give a very brief kind of killer whale 101. Um, the Southern resident killer whale clan uh, is called J clan. There's one clan that is con connected. All three of the pods within the clan, J, K, and L pods um, are connected by genetics, but also by their unique and shared culture as well as uh, their, their language. So they have a, a unique language that no other population of killer whales on the planet speaks. And within the clan, there are dialects. So J-Pod has their own dialect and K-Pod and L-Pod do as well. But overall, they're speaking the same language, maybe with just a little bit of, bit of an accent. And sadly, there are only 73 living Southern resident killer whales in the wild. And then we can't forget uh, Tokate, who is a Southern resident LPOD member who has been in captivity for the last 50, uh, 54 years. So um, there's big efforts to, to return her to a, a permanent seaside sanctuary uh, in her home waters. And if uh, anybody has any questions about that, if we have time, we can talk about that a little bit. So um, I always kind of um, am sure to add in um, that the fact that these whales have a unique culture. They engage in behaviors that we don't readily see in other populations, such as kelping, where these animals will go out of their way to play in kelp. Um, we also just have some other amazing um, behaviors that we see with these animals. And uh, again, I'm happy to talk more about them um, at the end, uh, but I definitely want to make sure that we have enough, uh, enough time to get through the material and then have a good Q&A. 
So the southern resident killer whales uh, eat sam, uh, sorry, only fish. These are not mammal eaters. Uh, within Washington State and really Oregon as well, uh, we we are fortunate to get to see three different ecotypes of killer whales. So uh, worldwide, all killer whales are the same species or sinus orca, just like all humans are Homo sapiens, but um, but they're unique in their populations. And uh, in Oregon and Washington, uh, we we can potentially have have an opportunity to encounter not frequently but three different ecotypes. The shark eaters are the most um, uh, the least the least well seen uh, or well documented. Those guys are mostly plying the waters of the outer coast from the continental shelf uh, inland. And uh, they do not intermingle. None of these different eco ecotypes intermingle with one another. Um, we then have the mammal eating killer whales that are uh, kind of resident, uh, the resident transients, as is my new joke. Um, those guys uh, are frequently now seen in the inland waters of the Salish Sea of Washington. They also ply the waters of Oregon. And these guys, the Northeast Pacific. Uh, mammal eating killer whales are specialists on things like stellar sea lions, California sea lions, harbor porpoise, dolls porpoise, and harbor seals. Um, they have been known to, uh, to forage on twice uh, minke whales in this region, but they are not the big, the big whale predators uh, that we see in California. The California transients, that's a different population and those guys are specialists in the larger whales. So often targeting migrating mom calf pairs on their Northern migration uh, back up uh, from the birthing and, and breeding grounds in Mexico and South America, um, heading back up to the nutrient rich waters in the Bering Sea and, and around that area. So um, again, and then of course, we've got the Southern resident fish eating killer whales that, uh, that eat fish, they do eat a number of different species, but by far, they, they preferentially forage on, on salmon and preferentially forage on Chinook salmon. So those are the Chinook are the king, uh, otherwise known as king salmon. And they are the ones that are the, the biggest, historically they've been the biggest and continue to be the biggest, most fatty lipid rich fish out there. So here's a good map of the Southern residents range. Um, so in the or right after they were listed as endangered in 2005, the summer core critical habitat was designated in the Salish Sea, and you see that in the orange-ish color. Um, and uh, that was great to get that inland water critical habitat protected. But it took the federal government in 2020 until 2021 to finally get around to uh, designating the outer coast critical habitat. And you can see here in this um, teal color that the Southern residents absolutely, their critical habitat on the outer coast uh, includes the entire coast of Oregon. And so this is just kind of graphic evidence that, um, that these whales are Oregon's uh, concern as well. So when the whales were listed in 2005, um, there were many different threats. Um, the Center for Biological Diversity, by the way, was critical in getting the listing um, because they petitioned the federal government to have these whales listed uh, on the endangered species list. That's a whole webinar on its own because that was her heroic um, efforts on uh, CBD's part, uh, as well as some uh, individuals and other nonprofits. But um, when the whales were listed, there were many different things that were identified as being threatening to their uh, potential for recovery. But um, these three kind of percolated to the top, the lack of prey, both in quality and quantity, Toxicants, so these are man-made chemicals making their way up the food chain and into the bodies of uh, all living things that that um, that are eating out of the marine realm, including killer whales and including humans, and then vessel presence and associated noise. So um, the the whales were listed in Canada under their version of the Endangered Species Act called the SARA Act, the Species at Risk Act in 2001. And as I mentioned, they were listed here as endangered in 2005 when there were 88 individuals. And now clearly I've just mentioned that there are only 73 were going the wrong way. And so that's that's you know just another reason to 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 really get everybody. Uh, um, up to speed and, and on the path of, of being involved in, in uh, calling for the, these whales to be recovered. 
So out of the identified threats, by far the biggest threat is declining prey in, in size and in abundance. So um, this is a, a picture from the turn of the last century with men um, in a cannery harvesting and canning uh, sockeye salmon. But the same thing happened with all species of salmon, as well as some smaller fish like herring. Um, we had massive, as humans became better at fishing, we became uh, very, very efficient killing machines, uh, able to, to take all, almost all, all, all of the fish out of a particular run. And at the time, I guess people didn't really realize um, how uh, far reaching and, and long lived those actions were um, because it has absolutely had detrimental impacts for the entire food web. Um, the pictures on the right are also interesting to note in that fish used to be so much bigger. So these are fish, the top picture shows pic uh, a picture of two men holding up these massive, massive, what are called June hogs. Um, they are also, uh, you know, these are these are Chinook salmon, king salmon, um, uh, that were weighing in at, at 116 and 121 pounds. These fish were caught just at Astoria in Oregon. Um, these are fish that were passing through the, the mouth of the Columbia and were, um, were harvested by humans. These are fish that would have been bound for the Snake River. Um, these are incredibly important, biologically very important animals. Um, that co-evolved and really honestly, it's the salmon that created the, the, the habitat that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. And it's really the, the main reason why, why so many people are calling for the removal of the Four Snake River dams, because th those dams are blocking these fish from their natal spawning grounds. So this is a busy, busy slide and I'm not gonna to take too much time on it, but just suffice it to say that um, overall, this is fish abundance available to the whales uh, coast-wide throughout their entire range. Uh, yes, it does span different time periods. Uh, down here, we've got it by year, but within, um, anyway, point being, uh, the more fish there is in uh, coast-wide available to the Southern residents, the fewer deaths we have per year. And so up here you have this purple bar chart where um, show it depicting Southern resident killer whale deaths. And so the longer the bar, um, the more deaths that year. And so you see this very clear correlation between low numbers of fish per year and high numbers of Southern resident killer whale deaths. So what is wild orca doing to try and address uh, this and try and um, fulfill our mission of, of, uh, of um, saving the Southern resident killer whales from extinction. Um, and what we do is non-invasive killer whale research, um, finding and collecting and analyzing theses. So floating poop that can tell us just a tremendous amount about what's happening on the inside of the whale by studying what's coming out. Here's a picture of uh, myself and my research partner, Jim and our dog, Eva. Um, and our new boat that we got uh, right around this time last year. And um, by doing this work, by utilizing a scent detection dog, it allows us to stay really far away from the whales. Um, our dog is able to locate uh, feces from uh, up to a, a mile away. It's been documented using GPS tracks. Um, generally speaking, we're about uh, 400 meters behind and to the side. Um, downwind of where the whales have just left, uh, just, you know, uh, left an area, we, we survey their path. And uh, when the dog has a change of behavior, we're able to turn the boat into the wind. And by a series of jockeying zigzag motions, um, following her nose, uh, she takes us right to the scat sample. And this is, uh, these are some pictures of, uh, they're quite old now, these photos were taken in 2009 and 10. Um, and this is showing very large, fatty, rich samples that floated at the surface. Now uh, we don't see these samples that are this big anymore because the fish throughout the Southern Residence Range and certainly within the Salish Sea here, um, the, the quantity of fish is lower and the quality of fish is lower. So they're not as lipid rich. And so they're, the whales are just not getting as, as um, nutrient rich uh, meals. And so they don't have these massive fecal samples to, to leave, leave behind. But when we do find a, a scat sample, we can, we can, let me go back really quickly. 
this, if we collected this out of the water, it would be a, a probably about three mils, three milliliters of, of wet feces. Once that gets dried down, it gives us just that small amount uh, will give us an opportunity to do um, about four of these tests. So we are able to look at um, individual ID. So who is the whale that left us the sample? Reproductive status. So if it's a female, we can tell if she's pregnant or was recently pregnant or uh, is coming into estrus and could, could get pregnant. Um, we can tell how, how well fed the animal is and what kind of stress level they're living under. With a bigger sample, higher volume sample, um, we can also add new tests or additional tests on like toxicant levels. We can look at a whole suite of different man-made chemicals that are making their way um, up the food chain. Um, many, in many cases, these are chemicals that were banned uh, 50 or more years ago, and, uh, and yet they're still prevalent in, in the um, marine realm, uh, in nature, in, in the food web, and making their way up into the, into the whale's blubber. If the whales are getting enough to eat, um, it's not great to be ingesting toxicants, but if they're getting enough to eat, those toxicants stay locked up in their fat stores and don't have uh, detrimental or uh, lethal impacts on the individual, as is evidenced by the mammal eating killer whales who are thriving. That population is growing like gangbusters, and um, they are actually technically more talk. They've got more toxicants in their system, and yet they're locked up because those whales, those mammal eating killer whales have enough to eat. So they're not metabolizing their fat stores for basic biologic or metabolic needs. That is not the case with the Southern residents. They are going through long periods of famine and then deeper famine with <clears throat> not getting enough to eat. We can also look at things like parasites. What's their parasite load? All, almost all whales we think have a certain level of worms in their system, which comes from the fish. And as long as the whales are not immune compromised, those worms are not a problem. Um, but it's when they, uh, it, it's kind of a synergistic negative, uh, negative vortex where everything's just working together uh, in, a, in a negative way to make the whales more susceptible to, the, to disease, more susceptible to, to high loads of, you know, a, a burgeoning population of parasites in their gut. Um, I can talk more about that later if you want. Um, but also amazing things like antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, we can look at microbiome, gut, my, uh, gut biome, um, fungus. And again, as I mentioned, a whole suite of, of uh, toxicants or persistent organic pollutants that are showing up in these whales. So to date, our findings are showing that 69% of the females in this population lose their calves before the, the calf is born viable. Um, or the you know the calf is born and takes a breath or two or maybe lives for a short period of time but then dies and um, also we also are showing when they're not getting enough to eat there is that amplification of toxins so the toxicants there those uh, pollutants are released into their system and we can see that coming out in their feces and when that's happening um, we also see a spike in stress hormones which again all of these working together. Uh, quite often and too often are leading to disease and early death in this population. You know, it, I guess in summary, wild orca has a very uh, strong belief that these whales have intrinsic value separate from what humans can uh, or deem valuable. They, they are uh, an ancient tribe, the original fishers of Pacific salmon. They've been here for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, um, plying the waters uh, of the Pacific Ocean um, and it, until uh, as recently as 150 or 140 years ago, had ample food and a, and a, and a growing healthy population. Um, so we'll continue to do the work that we're doing to, to spread awareness, collect the feces, understand the best available science and pass that on to policymakers. Um, if you want to learn more and get engaged, please, I, I really implore you to go to wildorca.org slash act. Um, not only will we teach you about the issues, but we'll help guide you uh, on how to engage yourself.
and to our amazing team. And, and I uh, keep meaning to update this slide uh, to show photos of, of the team, the back end team that makes so much of this happen, including Terry Wright, who's on the call, I think, Ali Barrett, who is uh, one of our amazing writers, our uh, board of directors, uh, Michael Hayes, Mike Sheridan, and Anna Gullickson. Um, we couldn't do this work without them and our amazing volunteers and uh, and our interns. We just onboarded uh, our two interns for the season yesterday, and I'm very excited to be getting out there on the water and uh, continuing this non-invasive non conservation research. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Giles. Quinn Reed, go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you. I am just going to share my screen here. Great. Okay. Well, um, thanks again to Oregon Wild and to Allie in particular for pulling this together and inviting us to speak to you all tonight. My name is Quinn Reed, and I'm the Oregon Policy Director for the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, now that you've heard Dr. Giles talk more about these incredible orcas, um, I want to talk a little bit more about what specific actions we're taking in Oregon to make sure the species has the protections it needs. So to start, just a little bit more about the Center for Biological Diversity. We are a national nonprofit with a very modest mission of uh, saving life on earth. Um, our goal is to secure a future for all species, great and small, hovering on the brink of extinction. Uh, we do this through science, law, and creative media, the focus on protecting lands, waters, and the climate that these species need to survive. All right, and so you saw uh, one of these maps in the previous presentation, but I just want to emphasize again that the Southern residents are truly Oregon's orcas. Now, I have to confess my own personal bias because I was born and raised in Washington. Um, my, my grandfather had a, a small sailboat and we would tootle around Puget Sound and up into the San Juans and the Southern residents, your neighbors in your backyard. So I, I think I had this, this perception that they're Washington's orcas. And it was really only after I started doing this work in Oregon that I realized, no, they are very much an Oregon species that depend on salmon from Oregon. So if you look at the map on the right, courtesy of Oceana, a great organization, you can see this a little bit better. You can see the full range. You can see how they come down from the mouth of the Columbia where they forage all the way down actually to Monterey Bay. And then you can also see, and hopefully it's clear enough to you, some of these really important salmon bearing streams, the Columbia, the Rogue, and Klamath are all Oregon rivers that are absolutely imperative um, for producing Chinook salmon that orcas need to survive. So just to drive this point home a little bit more, um, here is a really cool map um, drawn from uh, satellite tagging information. And this was of an individual from K-Pod. And you can see, look at all of these little, these points where they were uh, located here, going from the mouth of the Columbia all the way down the coast. Really cool to see their actual um, uh, travels here. And then you can also see on the left, this is just a few members of K-Pod at the mouth of the Columbia, which is really exciting. I cannot imagine how cool it would be to be chilling out there in Astoria or wherever and see a couple of members of the Southern residents. Um, anyway, let's move on and talk a little bit about the current protections. So you heard more about the threats to these species and how truly imperil imperiled they are with only 73 remaining members. So on the federal side, of course they are listed as endangered. Um, along with that comes protections for their critical habitat, and that habitat was recently expanded in the last couple of years to extend all the way down to uh, approximately Monterey Bay, which is great progress for them. Um, they're also protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, where they're categorized as a depleted species. So that's the federal level. On the state level, Washington state has listed them as endangered under the state ESA. 
Well, here in Oregon, it's a little bit different. So they are currently listed as a species of greatest conservation need. What does that mean? Um, unfortunately, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So um, this is a category under the state's uh, conservation strategy, which is our official wildlife action plan. And it indicates that the state recognizes that this species is, is in trouble needs help, but it has absolutely no legal effect. So this is a huge gap in protections for the species. Um, in fact, southern resident orcas are the only federally listed cetacean species that occur off of Oregon's coast that are not also listed under the Oregon ESA. Again, huge gap, and this is what we are trying to solve in this next year. Oh, let's see here. Okay, so this is just a screenshot for you. And this is from the Oregon Conservation Strategy, which is, by the way, a great resource. Um, I think it's just OregonConservationStrategy.gov. But if you Google it, you'll be able to find it. A wealth of information. Fortunately, not so much a wealth of information when it comes to the Southern residents. This, this little screenshot that you're looking at is it. That's the whole thing. So you can see here under special needs, they really only talk about noise disturbance. Um, limiting factors, they really don't address any of the issues that Dr. Giles highlighted as the top three threats to the species. And in conservation actions, it's simply observing the requirements under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Federal Endangered Species Act and filling data gaps. So there's a lot more the state can and should be doing. So let's get into a little bit of boring statutory law. So in case anyone wants to look this up, um, this is the citation for the Oregon Endangered Species Act. This is the Oregon Revised Statute. So if you want to make a note of that, that's where you can find it. Um, the Oregon ESA, gosh, it is not as strong of a law as we would like it to be. That is true. Uh, however, it is what we have available, and our goal is to make sure that it is used um, to its fullest extent. So in terms of the direct impacts, if we list southern resident orcas as endangered in the state, there's a few things that happen under the law. One is that immediately the State Fish and Wildlife Commission, and for those who don't know, the State Fish and Wildlife Commission is the body that oversees the Department of Fish and Wildlife and is responsible for making policy decisions about fish and wildlife management in the state. If you care about these issues, really important to know the commission and, and kind of understand how they work. So again, getting back to direct impacts. If the commission decides to list, the first thing that happens is that they issue survival guidelines. And that's exactly what it says it is. These are interim uh, guidelines, interim measures given out to all relevant state agencies to ensure the population survives. <laughs> so this is the first step. The second thing that happens, and this is the, this is the meat of the law, um, it requires the state to produce an endangered species management plan. And actually it's more appropriate to say it requires the state to produce plans because what happens is that the state does a survey looking at all of the state agencies that might have a role in recovering the species. And then each of those agencies working with the Department of Fish and Wildlife puts together its own plan. And that plan identifies the agency's role in orca recovery, identifies mitigation measures, uh, management actions, all kinds of things, restoration activities that that agency could do to support orca recovery. So that's where that increased agency collaboration comes in. And then of course, beyond the creation of the plans, these agencies are then hopefully talking more to each other about orca recovery and conservation. Um, in ways that they simply are not doing today. So indirect impacts. I think the biggest one is for the state to finally acknowledge its role in orca recovery, to step up and take responsibility um, for helping to recover this species. Um, public awareness is another piece of this, right? This is another way 
to broadcast that this is an Oregon species and to get people involved and aware of what we can do to help them. Um, another indirect impact is, is access to funding, right? I mean, once it's listed as an endangered species, all of a sudden it's easier to prioritize funding for restoration activities, for example, that will help them. Um, it could potentially help them access federal funding. So these are things that are, again, not written into the law, but are absolutely an impact of listing. Um, the other thing it does is it could complement existing efforts to recover salmon, oh, excuse that typo there. Um, and the state has taken actions to recover salmon, but they've done so without really any consideration for orcas, so just not part of the conversation. And we need that to change. We want them to have a holistic approach to salmon management. And then finally, I think it would help amplify Oregon's voice in regional processes. Um, you know, Governor Inslee in Washington convened an ORCA task force over the last several years. And Oregon was involved, but, you know, there were one or two representatives from Oregon. So it was a pretty meager showing, maybe is the way to put it. Um, and, and certainly actions in Oregon were not prioritized in uh, that task force's recommendation. So we want to we want to beef up Oregon's standing in regional processes like this. So let's talk just a bit about the listing process itself. So the conservation groups, the Center for Biological Diversity, Defenders of Wildlife, and Whale and Dolphin uh, Conservation, all fantastic groups doing great work on orcas, uh, filed a formal petition with the Fish and Wildlife Commission, gosh, just this February, it feels like a million years ago. Um, we filed a petition in February, which triggered a 90-day clock for the commission to respond. And they did so in April, 2023. Uh, we had some great folks who came out to testify, including Dr. Giles, who gave extremely compelling testimony, I think was so moving for the commission, and they accepted the petition, which is a really exciting step. Um, it's a little bit confusing, though, because accepting the petition doesn't mean that the orcas are listed. It just means they've said that the petition presented enough information to move forward. So within the next year, and this is why this is such a great time to be, to be talking about this, Within the next year, um, ODFW staff will prepare a status assessment for the species. Later, and we don't know exactly when, it will be within, and technically it's within 12 months of April. So before next April sometime, the commission will then announce formal rulemaking. And then there will be a public hearing to consider listing. So this is when there's great opportunities for people like you to get involved. Let's talk about that a little bit. If we want this to be successful, we really, really need people to be reaching out to the commission, to be making their voices heard. So one thing you could do today, and hopefully closer to, you know, once the uh, rulemaking is announced, one thing you, you could do today is to write to the Fish and Wildlife Commission and ask them to support listing Southern resident orcas as endangered. It just, it helps them to hear from people. It applies a little bit of pressure and it just reminds them they're not operating in a vacuum, right? That people are paying attention. Another thing we could do because we wanna keep up momentum and we wanna make sure that, that there's energy moving into the rulemaking process. You could write a letter to the editor in your local paper advocating for Oregon to step up. Right? I mean, these are really simple things we've got. I know that Oregon Wild has great resources about how to write LTEs, that's letters to the editor. Um, and they're really simple things. It's really just sharing your own perspective, your own opinions, and they're not very long. It's a great, great, great way to amplify issues. Um, another thing you can do right now, it is currently Orca Month. June of every year is Orca Month. Um, so you can visit orcamonth.com to find an event near you, learn more. Find out about more opportunities to get involved in Oregon and Washington. Uh, 
Likewise, you can sign up for alerts and updates on the listing process. And I mentioned this because this is a great way. We don't know yet when uh, rulemaking and a public hearing will occur, but this is a great way to stay informed. So you'll know when those opportunities come up. When that happens, it would be great to have lots of people sign up to testify and or write a comment. So that's another opportunity to write to the commission and get in the record uh, for this decision um, or to show up. You know, it's really impactful to have a room full of people asking the commission to take a particular action. So really exciting opportunity in this coming year to do something concrete for orcas in Oregon. Um, with that, I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, I've, I've included my email address, so please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. If you're interested in getting involved more deeply, I'd be happy to work with you. And again, thanks to Oregon Wild for, for hosting this terrific event. Awesome, Quinn. Thank you so much. We have a little bit of time for Q&A, about 20 minutes. We have quite a few questions, so I think we'll be able to dive more in depth with some of these answers, which is great. Um, let's see. Dr. Giles, could you talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned this in your presentation, but could you talk a little bit more about what other behaviors we see with the Southern residents? Oh yeah. Um, I, you know, one of my favorite ones uh, uh, that I like telling people about if they've never had an opportunity to see it is what we, um, what, what's been termed a greeting ceremony. And this is when the whales are coming into the, into the region and seeing each other, presumably for the first time in, in a space of time, we don't really know uh, how much time needs to, to be spent apart before they do a greeting ceremony upon coming together again, but <clears throat> possibly several months in between. But anyway, what it is, is you end up seeing this um, really beautiful um, ceremony where uh, whoever is there, let's, it's it's quite often J-Pod is, is in the inland waters first uh, in the season. Uh, let me take one step back just to say we don't get to see this very often. The last time was actually in 2020, whereas in the past, prior to 2013, we we saw this much, much, much more frequently, um, once or more times per year. So anyway, it's where one of the pods will be present um, in the in their kind of home waters, uh, summer home waters, and then when another pod comes in for the first time. Uh, they all line up by pod, you know, in, in a line, peck to peck like this, like shoulder to shoulder, all lined up so that you've got all of J-pod facing all of K-pod or L-pod, whoever has just come in. And then they're separated by anywhere from 100 meters to 250 meters or so, so not very far at all. And they just hover at the surface of the water and stare at each other and um, don't they don't make any sound. There's no um, acoustics going on, no calls, clicks or whistles. Um, and then we don't really know at all what the trigger is, what the social trigger is, but the whales, uh, something will happen. And then suddenly you just have this crazy whale ball with all the whales coming into each other and um, you know, um, rolling around on each other. You end up having the young males going off and um, we call it sword fighting. You can probably imagine what that looks like. Um, all the females that are pregnant end up going off in an area that, and they end up getting surrounded by the young females that uh, are just coming into estrus. Um, the old females will go off in one area and, and um, you know, lifelong friend, friendships will, friends will come back together and spend the rest of the day together. And it's just this fabulous I always liken it to like a, a large, large family that hasn't seen each other for a year or more coming together over a holiday. Um, you know, you just kind of check out like who's there, who's there, oh, who's, oh my gosh, look, there's some, so-and-so has a new baby sort of thing. And then just this crazy, beautiful social interaction. So I, I will tell you um, about the last one that I, I was witness to. And I, I, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a prop, uh, like a full, full on proper 
uh, superpod since then. And a sup people have started to use this word incorrectly to, to mean that there are some members of all three pods present at the actual definition of a super pod is when all members of the Southern residents are within calling range of one another. So within the same geographical region. The last time this happened was actually in September of 2020, um, uh, two years after J35 Telequa gave birth to a, a female calf who died right away. And then she carried that calf around in 2018 for uh, 17 days, over two weeks. She carried her, her dead baby around <clears throat> and it was made headline news around the world. Um, you know, many of us that study these whales and have been pushing for their recovery said, have said that, um, you know, she did more to, to um, highlight and amplify the plight of, of her family and her population um, in those 17 days than all the research combined has ever been able to do. Because she really, you know, there was just no denying that she was grieving and just would not let that baby go. Well, the 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 nice story I'll end on with regard to that and su and and uh, super pods is is that in September of 2020 she came back with a with a new baby, a a, bo a baby boy, and um, my partner uh, husband Jim and I, COVID, it, we couldn't have anybody else on the boat. We were way out closer to Port Angeles than we were to San Juan Island. And uh, we knew that we had heard on the radio that J-35 was coming down from the north, coming over towards us from San Juan Island, and that she had a new calf. And out of nowhere, nowhere, K's and L's were reported coming in to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And they all coalesced right in that big body of water between Port Angeles and Victoria, BC, Canada, and San Juan Island. And they all just came together. And we saw that. We saw those those groupings and um, just surface active behaviors everywhere you looked. It was just the most stunning thing. How on earth does these two pods that were not in calling range of one another knew to come into the, into the Strait of Juan de Fuca and greet this new baby and celebrate with J35, her new baby? I will never be able to explain. But they were gone by that evening. They were seen exiting the Strait of Juan de Fuca that next day. And so these are things that really makes one question like, you know, they don't have cell phones, they don't have Instagram or Facebook. How on earth did Hayes and Owls know that J Pod had a new baby? But they did. And they came in and they greeted one another and they had a super pod gathering and then they left. And so these are these are the things that those of us that uh, are in love with this population, and, you know, want so desperately to see this population recover. Um, these are the stories I want to tell to hopefully um, engage with people and um, and give them a sense of, of who these animals are, not what these animals are, but who these animals are. Um, shout out to Chris uh, Kevorkian, who's also on the, on the line here. Um, you know, we really need to recognize these animals as individuals living, trying to live their best life. And um, we need to do everything we can to recover uh, recover them. And what that means is, is turning back the clock a little bit on some of the damage that we've done um, that are uh, that is impacting this population and everything else in the food web um, so much. So, wow, that was a super long answer. Sorry about that, but there you go. <laughs> That was an amazing story. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep rolling with the questions. Um, next one is, does wild orca work with any tribes to research or restore orcas? Uh, we work pretty closely with um, uh, a, a number of individuals. I can't say that we work with tribes per se, but we work with individuals uh, within the Swinomish tribe, Lummi tribe, I've had the great honor to to be able to um, you know work with and on the governor's task force as Quinn talked about um, have uh, um, have meet people from different tribes um, that I've had an opportunity to work with. I think the one that um, I've been spending the most amount of time with is um, Chairman Shannon Wheeler, 
with the Nez Perce tribe. And the, the, that tribe is very, very much pushing for the removal of the Four Snake River dams because those dams flooded their historical uh, homes and their usual, usual and, um, and um, accustomed fishing grounds. And uh, uh, Shannon Wheeler is uh, now the uh, feature. Um, it, that story is a, a, the new uh, story uh, that's being told by uh, film director, uh, creator, and director Shane Anderson. It's called The Covenant of the Salmon People. It's a, um, a, an amazing story, uh, amazing film that tells the story of, of the Nez Perce tribe. So I strongly encourage anybody to see that movie. Also, um, Shane Anderson's other film called The Lost Salmon, uh, which is a fabulous movie. I really cannot say enough about this movie. It just won an Emmy. Um, and that is available, I do believe, still for free on PBS channel. So you can Google that. That is a phenomenal film and truly um, shows the, the best film I have ever seen of a salmon spawning up a river, up a waterfall. He was able to actually capture uh, how salmon get over a waterfall. If you've ever stopped to think about what, what these animals are and how uh, accomplished they are as, as beings on the planet, that this film captures that. And then, and then so much more it covers. So I highly, highly suggest those two films by Shane Anderson. Thank you. I've seen the Lost Salmon one. It's great. I'm sure the other one is amazing too. So Thank you for so much for those recommendations. Next question is, Oregon Wild works to protect mature and old growth forests. Can you speak a little about how important forests are to salmon, which then translates to how important forests are to the Southern residents? I'm gonna punt that one to Quinn. Sure, sure, I can speak to that briefly. And and yes, huge kudos to Oregon Wild for all their incredible work to protect Oregon's forests. Um, but there's some really cool synergistic relationships between impact forests and salmon. Um, but just in brief, you know, healthy intact forests support clean, cool, healthy waterways, which benefit salmon. And then, of course, in return, when salmon die, their bodies help fertilize those forest ecosystems. It's actually really cool. I mean, to the point where there's programs for departments of fish and wildlife, and I believe both Washington and Oregon, you know, both do this, where they will go out and throw salmon carcasses out onto like stream beds to facilitate that fertilization. So incredible synergistic relationship there. So all of this work is necessary. You know, when we talk about protecting orcas, we are talking about protecting Chinook, which means we're talking about protecting habitat for Chinook and restoring habitat that's been lost and making sure that we've got cool streams that have sections of slow moving waters and the kinds of qualities that salmon need to reproduce. So it truly is, is all connected. And um, Ellie, if I may, I saw that, um, Terry also asked, or there was also a couple of other questions about the recent proclamation in Depot Bay. I'd love to address that because there were a couple that came up. And um, I think that came from Chris and Heather. So I just want to thank you for bringing that to our attention and thank you for all of your work on that. So for those who don't know, just recently the city of Depot Bay um, issued a proclamation and I don't know the exact words of it, um, but basically it recognizes the inherent rights of the Southern resident orcas to exist in this habitat. And it is so cool to see these cities stepping up and saying like, we see our responsibility to these creatures, to these families that depend on our waters. And, you know, to add to the list of things that we can do to help them is absolutely supporting those efforts. And Chris, you very graciously mentioned legal rights for the Salish Sea, Earth Law Center, and Northwest Animal Rights Network. Um, so if you are a resident of a coastal city, this is a great thing you can do. You could petition your own city council to issue its own proclamation, which is another way of increasing uh, public attention and awareness and just getting decision makers to start stepping up. So I'm incredibly excited that Depot Bay is showing that leadership and 
that's another way of maybe pushing on the commission to say, hey, we've got cities out here on the front lines that are recognizing their role. It's time for the state to back them up. Yeah, that was super exciting news when I heard about it. Um, we're all cheering for sure. Let's see. Next question is, there's actually two questions related to this, so I'm just going to ask one of them. Um, what level of concern is there about local orcas learning the small boat wrecking behavior that has begun in European waters? Oh my goodness. Um, uh, I'll just take a quick stab at this just to say that just today I've given, I think five interviews. I have one at 1145 this evening that's going to be live in the UK. There is so much interest in this phenomenon, and I just wish that we would have a quarter of the amount of attention being paid to the, to the Southern residents and their plight as is being paid to this situation uh, in the Strait of Gibraltar and, the, and that area, not to diminish or, or trivialize the, the you know, concern and probably sheer terror that those people that are on the boats might be feeling, but these are not whales that are attacking people. Um, if they wanted to attack people, they would attack people. They would ram the boats, smash them into smithereens, and then when people were in the water, do whatever it is that this, you know, uh, you know, people's wildest imaginations are are uh are imagining um these are these are whales that are whales are incredibly tactile individuals they readily um engage with things in their environment including each other including things like uh buoys um birds uh pretty much anything you can imagine you know i've seen uh young killer whales grab on with their mouth to the trailing edge of an adult uh, con specific and be just pulled a, pulled along for a ride. Um, they 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 are playful, um, incredibly curious animals. And what I think is happening is is that you know one animal interacted with the keel, the deep deep long part that that sticks down into the water underneath a sailboat. And there's something about that keel, whether it's a vibration uh, uh, that they are sensing or or feeling. Um, maybe water rushing around the keel that they're that they're playing in. There's something about uh, protruding parts of a boat that the whales are interested in. I, I, I can't stress this enough that if those whales wanted to harm people, people would be harmed. And yet when the boats stop moving, the whales are not interested in any, anymore. And so what I would very much like to see and what I keep telling, you know, anybody that's uh, calling me for a uh, comment is is that you know at really at this point we need to be focusing our attention on what are we going to do about this how are we going to continue to raise awareness about the fact that this is a this is a uh, a playful as terrifying as it might be to humans but this is a this is not an agonist, uh, agonistic activity and uh what can humans do to lessen the interest that these whales have in those boats that's what i would like to see uh people focusing on because I'm, I, I am concerned that uh, the, the more media portrays this as a negative thing, where the the boats are, you know, being attacked, and there's some sort of retribution, um, all these, you know, very inflammatory words. I do worry that somebody or somebody's will take it into their own hands to, uh, you know, sort out the situation in in a lethal or harm, harmful way um, against the whales and. Really, we need to uh, understand that we're in their house, we're in their kitchen, um, we're uh, in their space. And so it's up to us. The responsibility is ours to find ways to lessen the whale's interest in engaging in this behavior. That was a great answer. That being, <laughs> that being said, there is a brand new account of a of a of a interaction between a fishing boat in uh, near Shetland in the UK. Um, 3,000 miles away. Uh, I got a call about that. Do I think that this is a behavior that's being transmitted to new populations? I do not think that's the case. I think that what's happening is because there's such media attention to the Iberian uh, Peninsula issue, 
that people from around the world that are having these non lethal, you know, contact interactions with killer whales will gain more attention in the media. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for clearing that up. That's a really important perspective for people to understand. I think we have time just for one last question. I'll squeeze it in because I know we have a few folks from California and I want to make sure that they can also um, help with this issue too. So the question, and it is probably a little bit for both of you, is what is the state of California doing to help? Is there anything being done by the environmental community there? Um, and as a California resident, would emails from this person be considered for the commission? Or if not, is there other ways they can engage? I can certainly start with this question. So first of all, yes, absolutely. If you are a California resident, you can absolutely write to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I think in doing so, you can you can own being from California and say, I want the state of Oregon to take action so that these whales can continue to exist and come down to California where I live. So I think you just talk about it from your perspective and your like what your interest is in seeing Oregon take action. The more specific you can be, the better. But yes, absolutely, I think you can weigh in. In, in terms of actions um, that are being considered in California, you know, we've actually been talking about a state listing in California as well. So to my knowledge, that's not happening yet, but things are percolating. So stay tuned. We're just working our way down the coast. <laughs> awesome. Well, it is 7.01, so I'll have to end the webinar, but thank you all for joining us. I hope you've learned a lot. I can also um, send out an email with different ways to take action since I know it was a lot um, and provide some links if that's helpful. So thank you all so much for joining. Thank you, Quinn. And thank you, Dr. Giles. Have a great rest of your evening, everyone. And let's take action on orcas. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Bye, Quinn. Nice to see you. Thanks. Bye.